Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this, for coming to this session and welcome again. This is Student Security Superbox Africa. And uh, yeah, we are part of a student initiative that champions against antimicrobial resistance in African community. We do involve the young people, that is the students across all uh, learning institutions across Africa. I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Professor Martin Maiden, who is a professor of biology at the University of Oxford. He is also the honorary chair at the University of Cardiff. And uh, he is also uh, the professor at Maiden, Martin Maiden Laboratory. Uh, and in his group, they study a population biology and evolution of bacterial pathogens with the objective of translating the insights obtained into benefits for human health. Their work focuses on two globally important pathogens, that is Neisseria meningitis and Campylobacter gigani, although they work on other pathogens through a variety of collaborations. They use a population genomics approach, which combines data on genome sequence diversity with a variety of types of phenotypic information assembled from large representative bacterial isolate collections, uh, making extensive use of collaborations within and outside the department. They explore use of data with a range of analysis approaches, including epidemiological studies, dynamic modeling, and phylogenetic and genealogical investigation. That's just a brief introduction about uh, Professor Maiden and their work at the laboratory. And to, without taking much time, um, handing over to Professor Maiden to start off the session. Over to you, Prof. Okay, let me, let me uh, I hope you're able, I can't hear you. I think you're muted, Professor. Oh, sorry, yes, you, you need to enable screen yeah, sharing. Yeah, 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 sure. Right, hello everybody, nice to meet you all. Um, as soon as I can, I'll share my screen. Um, ah, yes, I can now share the screen, great. So let me uh, do that. Hopefully you can see that, see that now. Yeah, sure, we can see, Prof, go on. Is that okay, good, right, okay. Um, Good. So, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, uh, I've changed the title slightly, I hope you don't mind. Uh, rather than detection, I've bonded it out to bacterial characterization. Um, uh, and uh, because I think at the moment, uh, although bioinformatics is likely to be used um, in detection, uh, it's, it's something the actual use of bioinformatics as, as a detection technique uh, is uh, perhaps in its infancy, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit going through. Um, I've also, um, I'm going to be a little bit bold, I'm going to give you a few slides, and then I'm going to give you a demonstration of some of our biomatic software, specifically in the realm actually of, um, of uh, epidemiological disease outbreak. Um, not, not specifically AMR, it's more vaccine related, but we can talk about that and hopefully have a little bit of um, interactive um, uh, issues on that. So after the slides, I'm going to do a demo and I hope that works, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. I'm being a little bit bold with a, a live software demo because obviously bioinformatics is very much a, a live issue. In fact, it's such a live issue. I've just come back from this conference, which I've actually been involved to organizing now, what, 12 or 15 years. I used to be on the organizing committee when we started this uh, applied bioinformatics and public health microbiology. Um, uh, the ideas of being able to use these types of approaches in public health and particularly globally have been around for 20 years. Actually getting them to work in the field in practice has proved a lot more difficult and um, uh, the field is now picking up speed, particularly uh, uh, in, the, uh, the, uh, in the aftermath of the COVID um, uh, epidemic. Now, I just want to, uh, so I thought I'd start, uh, I, I know it's a fairly general audience and I hope I'm getting the uh, level right, but we, we, um, we, we, I would just start by a, a really sort of asking what the question of what is bioinformatics? And the reason why I posed that is that bioinformatics means different things to different people. If you can see here, the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is actually on the same campus at Hinkston near Cambridge, where the uh, conference was I just mentioned, uh, here they've got a rather broad 
view of bioinformatics, which you might expect from the bioinformatics into. They're talking about genes, genome variation, gene, protein metabolite expression, protein sequences, families, molecular structures, chemical biology and systems, which actually, in a way, is sort of biology in the whole study of life. And, and of course, bioinformatics can be viewed in that respect. But actually, most people, when they're talking about bioinformatics, they're talking about the interface of uh, biology with computers. And of course, lots of different subjects can do that. And there's lots of ways and integrating data is important. Um, but generally, what we're really talking about mostly in bioinformatics and what most people recognize today is it's actually the manipulation of sequence letters, uh, which is either nucleotides, we've only got four letters, A, C, G, and T, of course, U if we're talking about RNA, um, or, or peptide sequences, um, uh, which is amino acids, so glycine, serine, arginine, phenylalanine, and the rest, and of course there's 20 there. So what sometimes people don't realize is that, uh, that often a lot of bioinformatics is just looking at sequences of letters and seeing how they change. Now, the clever bit, of course, is that there's now there's a very large number of those sequences. Um, so the volume sequence data now have grown. I mean, when I started uh, about 40 years ago, my career in research, uh, sequencing was extremely hard and the number of sequences we had was very small and my whole PhD was sequencing one gene in E. coli. Um, and that was a similar sort of pace of how we could do other functional experiments. Well, that's no longer true. Now we can produce sequence data at a rate that's so far in excess of other data that, that be, in a way, that's almost a problem. We've almost got too much data. So analyzing that and putting it together is what bioinformatics is all about. And the analysis often involves the application of particularly statistical, statistical, genetical, and mathematical models. But most people who are statistical geneticists wouldn't necessarily call themselves bioinformaticians, actually. Uh, that's a separate discipline itself. And quite often when you're using bioinformatics protocols or programs, uh, the statistical genetics of statistics and the hard math is often hidden behind the program interface. And indeed, to do bioinformatics, you don't need to be a statistical geneticist because that's what uh, the interface does for you. But you do need to understand how it is. I thought I'd give you another a couple of words as well about what my view well what the view what views are of public health um so public health can be contributing to uh, reducing the cause of ill health and improving people's health and well-being through such thing as health protection looking after air food but of course infectious disease is what we're thinking of today um and also improving people's health and well-being inequalities health inequalities so for example even just people stopping smoking or improving their living conditions is part of public health and health services are also part of that as well. So infectious disease and what bioinformatics can do to public health is just part of public health. Um, and particularly what bioinformatics can help with is public health intelligence, disease surveillance, and I'll talk a bit about that, monitoring and assessment, and academic public health, which is uh, research um, uh, and promoting evidence is something that I've been involved in for a long time. Um, and as I say, bioinformatics increasingly involved in this. There's this nice diagram from the CDC showing how, uh, um, how public health can work as a sort of circular process. And so that's what we think of these days, public health. Um, and this, the left-hand side is from the NHS in the UK, um, the, the, uh, their view of the NHS and, and the right-hand side is the CDC. And these are very sort of general views of how public health works. Now, there's a paradox with public health, which uh, sort of um, I always like to, to raise in this issue, because um, in my view, uh, public health is um, is a bit like, well, in fact, sewage is part of public health um, and, and good public health is like good sewage. And, and, and people who have it don't appreciate the importance of, 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 uh, of, of good uh, sanitary engineering. But the moment you don't have good sanitary engineering, then you do notice the benefit, and indeed one of the biggest benefits to public health is sanitary and theory. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that bad public health is really like bad sewage. Um, the trouble is, here's a bit from the BBC website in the UK. Uh, suddenly, everybody gets interested in the sewage system when there's a disaster um, a bit, and the sewage leaks out and so on. And uh, so getting that infrastructure in place and putting it in place and making it work should mean that, that, that things get very, uh, that you don't realise it. So this is a real paradox because if public health is working well, you don't know about it. Um, 
And if it doesn't work well, then you do learn about it. Now, the problem is that the moment you fix the public health problem, it can mean that people take their, 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 they, they, they take their eye off the ball. They, they forget to, to prioritize it. And actually you can lionize sometimes uh, public health when things are bad, when actually really you should be lionizing public health when things are good. Um, public health is successful when we, we're managing to contain diseases, when nobody knows it's going on. It should be a quiet success. But that's a challenge uh, uh, because uh, the moment you've succeeded doing it then, and, and you're, you're, you've, you've got, for example, infectious diseases well under control, then it's difficult sometimes. And what one of the things we have to do as scientists is remind people that that is a dynamic situation. We only keep things quiet and, and in a good sense by... Um, by, by being active and doing our jobs very well. Some of the things I've done in public health have received no publicity at all because they've worked well. So nobody's had an epidemic. Um, and as I think, as I say, we've seen recently when public health goes wrong, uh, everybody knows about it um, uh, and, and it becomes top of everybody's agenda. So I want to talk about characterizing pathogens for public health rather than detection because that's a subset of it. And, and why do we want to characterize pathogens? Well, if we got a, a bacteria, one thing is we want to know what is the bacterium that's causing disease. And that's a crucial uh, part of a public health response, knowing uh, that you've got a disease caused by a particular organism. And the discovery of the germ and the importance of germ and disease has underlined a huge number of advances in public health. Now, that's not to say good sanitary measures, for example, can be put in place even if you don't know that the particular problem you've got is cholera or typhoid or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but the particulars of disease management can be very influenced and particularly uh, uh, by knowing exactly what disease you're causing. Um, you, you also want to know, uh, which is the germane to the, your particular, is, is, is resistance in organisms. So characterize, once you've identified an organism, you know what likely antibiotic resistance it's going to have, how those antimicrobial resistances occur and so on and so forth. Um, and that's another important part. Another thing we need to know, and we'll talk about this a bit later, we want to know what the relationships are of organisms to each other. Uh, we want to analyze transmission for chains, for example. I mean, a, a big example of this was, uh, as some of you may remember, the cholera outbreak that happened in Haiti. And it was very, uh, there was a big uh, debate about how uh, where that had come from. And in the end, a colleague of mine who actually is visiting me at the moment, Paul Kime in, from Northern Arizona University, they were able to sequence some, some isolates from Nepal and from Haiti, which showed that actually the outbreak in Haiti came from Nepal. And that led to understanding the transmission, which came in asymptomatically from people who came as peacekeepers from Nepal and were in Haiti. So understanding those transmission chains can be extremely important. And of course, they, they, we also need to know whether um, whether we have uh, global outbreaks, whether we have global strains monitoring disease, disease trends. So that's why we need those sorts of characterizations. A really crucial part of public health, and only and and um, uh, evidence based microbiological public health really only became possible once we identified that germs were causing disease, and then we could subtype them and identify that different terms cause different disease, which of course is fundamental that Robert Koch established. So now we know that. The other thing we have to remember is that um, we've got a plethora of data and a plethora of ways of looking at it. Um, and uh, but when you've got so much rich data nowadays, which we can have, uh, we have to think very carefully about what data we need and why we need it. So um, I always like to try and uh, tell people that the important thing is your question. And the questions actually are quite different in public health and clinical microbiology. So you start off, obviously, with this a sick child with meningitis. You have a certain set of questions about how you treat, what the antimicrobial resistance of that is and so on. As I said earlier, you might want to know, which is a slightly different question, how that individual got the disease. You may also need to know how that reflects the spread, for example, in Europe. So you might have an outbreak going on in Europe, which has led to this particular outbreak, which has led to this outbreak. You want to know about the global spread. And you may want to know, for example, here's the gonococcus and the meningococcus. This is an individual with meningococcal disease. The gonococcus is a very different disease from meningococcus. Interestingly, antimicrobial resistance is very important in the gonococcus. It's not in the meningococcus, but actually they're very genetically closely related, even though they cause very different diseases. So um, the, we ought to know the differences, even though they look very similar between those organisms. 
So these are, you can think of as being questions of diagnosis, epidemiology, emergence, and evolution happening over very different time scales. Uh, in the case of diagnosis, you want to be doing this in a matter of hours, sometimes even minutes, very close. Uh, outbreaks are going to be occurring in days or weeks, uh, uh, epidemics uh, over a longer period, and then you, you, you go back when you're looking at that. So that means the type of genetic information we need is also going to be different. So um, the relative amount of genetic change is going to be happening in a short time because genetic change, the, cha the rate of genetic, uh, genetic change is largely to do with how long you, uh, you spend doing it, it is very low in, in, uh, in, because it's a short time span, but there's relatively more genetic change uh, in uh, obviously over longer periods of time and intermediate simply. So that means your discrimination how, how, how detailed your analysis needs to be changes from relatively low to relatively high. And this is where sequence-based information can be very, very useful, particularly in unpicking. It can be useful at all stages of this, but particularly in unpicking very high resolution things. But these are, these are issues that we have to take into account when we're asking the question. So we can't just say, oh, I'm gonna go on a disease outbreak, I need to do some e e uh, analysis or, or you need to be have very clear in your mind exactly what the precise question is you're um, asking. <coughs> now, working on for clinical and microbiology labs have an enormous problem, and I'm going to ex explain, and which which makes it also sort of very interesting. And I'll explain this in the next couple of slides. So the first problem is that we live in the plat, what I like to call the planet of the bacteria. Indeed, the great evolutionary biology, St Stephen Jay Gould discovered the bacteria in this article many years ago. He, he worked on dinosaurs and evolution and things like this. And he, he was really, <laughs> out, out, he was astounded when he discovered bacteria and he found that actually most of life is bacteria. Um, and then that's, of course, not surprising because the bacteria evolved, you know, life on Earth evolved about three and a half billion years ago. And for most of the time, that's just been bacteria. Then there's been cilia, single cell organisms, multicell organisms relatively recent. And of course, we're very recent uh, arrivals on the scene. Now, if I've got a, a tree here that was drawn, it's, um, it's quite an old one, but it nevertheless, it, it's, it's a tree of all of life. And you can see that the bacterial part, which is this part in purple, is much bigger and more diverse than uh, this is uh, the eukaryotes. And if we just annotate this, um, here we can see uh, mice and men are more or less identical on this scale. Uh, plants are over here. Um, you know, there's not that much diversity within the whole eukaryotes and particularly not in the, um, in, in the multicellular ones. But bacteria have this enormous diversity because they've been evolving for a very long time. What I said before about the age, uh, diversity is primarily to do with age. The longer time you've got, uh, the more mutations you get. But just look at this. These well-known pathogens um, are spread throughout the tree. So this tells us two things. One thing it tells us that pathogenesis, the ability to cause disease, has evolved multiple occasions from a much larger population of organisms that never cause disease and don't cause disease. Um, uh, so that means that they're very, very different from each other. So if you're working in a clinical lab or looking at the pathogen data, you're, you've got a much bigger problem than most biologists because you're looking at essentially virtually the whole diversity of life. There's an enormous difference between a streptococcus pneumonia and a Vibrio cholerae, even though you might think of them both as being pathogens. So that's our first problem, enormous diversity which really makes a problem. And um, it means that we can't treat all bacteria, for example, as the same. They have completely different evolutionary paths, very different systems. Uh, their population biologies can be very different. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to discuss this in much detail today, but uh, I can give you a little hint of some of the problems. The next problem um, is, um, is how bacterial, how diverse they are. So once you've got this phylogen, we've got all these different bacteria. Um, if we look at their genome, we can sequence all their genomes and their genomes appear to be uh, nice and simple because they're relatively short. Here's the meningococcus genome. It's only 2.2 megabase pairs. Um, it has about uh, 2000 genes in it. But the problem with that is that bacterial genomes are not like our genomes. Our genomes are what we call closed genomes. Every human being has ex essentially exactly the same gene component as every other human being. And because we're a young species, we are genetically virtually identical. 
Uh, often we uh, think a lot about the phenotypic differences between different people, but actually genetically, we are really one very close family. We're very, very closely related to each other. And the differences amongst us are either very superficial in terms of things like hair and skill color or to do with our immune interactions. But in fact, within different human populations, there are no real genetic differences. That is not at all true with the bacteria. Bacteria, even within what you might we might call a single species, are enormously diverse. And they're diverse in two ways. They're diverse in terms of the sequence variation. They a lot of them have accumulated lots of sequence variation over time. But they also uh, um, they vary in terms of their gene content. So many bacteria, not all of them, many have bacteria have what we call a core genome. So that's uh, a, a number of genes that every member of the species have. But then they also have this accessory genome. And in fact, that can be a large part of the genome or part of it, um, and indeed can have much of the diversity in it. And what that means is the core genome is all the things that every cell has, but the accessory genome contains all these alternative elements. They also have uh, elements that are parasitic, uh, phages, toxins, and restriction modification systems, which can, uh, which often are sort of freeloaders that have been infected the bacteria and, or, and, and don't necessarily help them, or they can move. And then we have a sort of much wider gene pool. And the gene pool is really all those genes that have been evolving in the whole bacterial universe, if you like, for three and a half billion years. Now, that just gives you an idea of how much variation is. Now, although we don't even exchange DNA with our closest relatives, because that's how mammalian species work, we're a species because we, we don't exchange DNA with other species, we're, we're isol genetically isolated, bacterial species are not genetically isolated. A few of them are, but by and large, most of them are. So all this massive variation can be moved, mobilized, sometimes with mobile elements, sometimes with other persons, from uh, this wider gene pool into the bacterial. So that is one of the big reasons we have problems with antimicrobial resistance, because a, an antimicrobial resistance may have evolved somewhere completely else in the microbial world, and it gets into a species that causes uh, disease. So um, uh, we're, we're fighting with an enormous amount of diversity that's accumulated over a long period of time. So that's our two problems, ancient diversity and uh, organizational diversity and bacterial genomes. So all of this, when we're doing our bioinformatics analyses and our evolutionary analyses, we, we have to take it account of. Um, so, but the good thing about sequence data is once we've got a whole genome is we can do lots of stuff with it that's relevant. Um, we can do typing or phylogeny. This has become an increasingly important view of uh, uh, of, of, of um, uh, this is drawing trees, or in fact, this is a, a network graph, which is because this is Neisseria meningitis, where, uh, um, where, where uh, which has lots of recombination. So trees are not as useful. Ordinary uh, uh, cladograms are not so useful. We can look at particular parts of the genome, for example, the ones that make the capsules, and this is a meningococcal capsule antigen, uh, which is important because it's a vaccine component. And if, um, uh, we can look for vaccine coverage. This is a new meningococcal vaccine, um, and we can uh, uh, we can look at see at the variant, have what the variants are there. Obviously, we can look at antimicrobial resistance genes. We can search for the genes that we know provide resistance. Or we can look at different genes, the organisms that we know resistance and find what the genetic basis is. And we can look at their metabolism, uh, which is often closely related because a lot of our antibiotics attack parts of bacterial metabolism that are specific to bacteria and we don't find in humans and much more. So we have this, as, um, as uh, Paul, who I mentioned earlier, said, the genome is a marvellous place to work. But it's also a complicated place to work. And that's the tool of bioinformatics to make it a bit easier. So just to give you an idea of what a genome looks like, this is the third, one of the first, this was the second actually, the second Neisseria meningitis genome to be sequenced. And this is a, an annotated representation of that whole genome. As I say, it's about two million base pairs and about 2000 genes. The average microbial gene is about a thousand base pairs normally. And as you can see, most of the genome is annotated as genes, which are these little blocks boxes, um, which means unlike human genomes, bacterial genomes tend to be very compact. They don't have this intergenic DNA, which does all sorts of interesting things in human genomes. Bacteria have much smaller genomes. Um, don't be too fooled by the annotation, though, because although we understand what many of these thousand 
2000 genes do we do not understand all of them uh, and a lot of our understanding of genes is very partial so our ability to do bioinformatics is as i said earlier restricted very much by our functional knowledge of these uh, systems as well now, just to say, uh, I started my life working on one antigen gene, which I was interested in because, uh, uh, you know, and so we used to just sequence these genes to find out the genetic diversity of them because, and this gene has actually been incorporated on a vaccine now. Um, and then this is another antigen gene. So, you know, these tiny amounts of the genome. Uh, we were often interested in the capsular locus because this produces the capsular polysaccharide, I've said before, which is an important virulence determinant and used in vaccines. Um, and then we developed about 20 years ago a, a technique called multi-locus sequence typing, which has become the sort of textbook way to act, isolate bacteria, but again, uh, to characterize. But, but again, we're only using very small amounts of the genome uh, to do that because that's all we could do for a long time. It was difficult to access lots of the genome. Um, and over the years, we increased our capacity to look at more and more loci. This is the ribosomal genes and so on and so forth. But now we can look at everything because whole genome sequencing will give us a, uh, the ability to analyze every single gene in the genome. Now, the question there is, do we need that analysis and what use can it be put to? And I'll be talking a little bit about that um, uh, further on. So I want to say a little bit about how we organize sequence data. Again, it's really important to realize that uh, bacteria have uh, although we have species and uh, gene genera and so on in bacteria, they are defined in very different ways. But here we have a, phy a phylogenetic tree, tree of uh, going from phylum right the way down to individual clone, and you have these class, order, family, genus, species. Um, uh, we can uh, we can envisage characterizing these at different levels. So you may have heard of 16S RNA, that's used a lot for species for identifying bacteria, but it's really relatively low resolution. We can only work out a genus or a species. Uh, the technique of MLST I told you about is really, it's not so good at doing that, but it's very good at working out uh, whether things belong to uh, the, the genetic variation within bacterial species. And that can be important because you will find that some bacteria are much more likely to cause disease than others even within a species uh, so that can be really important in public health and then when one's looking down at these very detailed levels that can be extremely important by looking at the evolution of a disease outbreak and i put on here how we've modified ribosomal mlst and whole genome mlst these different approaches using different amounts of genes uh, to study these different uh, uh, gene, uh, genetic structures and the, uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate some of these ideas. And hopefully this can lead on to a, conversa a conversation using the BigsDB software that we developed about. Well, we've been developing for 20 years, but the genome version of it is about uh, 12 years, 13 years old, which is a way of integrating sequence data with um, uh, with other data in order to get public health and other inference. So this is a description of how it works. Uh, uh, and as I say, we we we, we developed the first iteration of this science uh, software uh, about about twenty years ago. But we made it fully genome compliant ten years or well, twelve years, thirteen years ago, um, with this software developed by um, colleague Keith Jolly. And basically, what this does is it takes sequence information which can be everything from a single sequence to a whole genome sequence. We don't mind how much it is. Um, um, we annotate that. So we find out what genes are present and we link it with what uh, people often call metadata. And I like to call provenance and phenotype data. This is uh, the, what, the, the, uh, what the bacterial isolate is doing and where it comes from. And we wrap this around with something we call an API, which is an automated program interface, which means that this can talk to other computers uh, in, in, in an automated way. So people can come in and visit this data and extract it. We link to in external light tapes, such as the ENA, which is run by the EBI I mentioned earlier, PubMed and NCBI, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and then you have communities of users who use the data, uh, but you have people who submit data to the database and then people who curate the data in other work, make it uh, work. So we have um, hundreds of... Uh, um, hundreds of curators, thousands of submitters, and tens of thousands of users, roughly to, to speaking, using the PubMLST uh, platform that runs on this database. 
And what can we do with that? Well, what we can do is we can uh, analyze, curate and disseminate sequence data. Um, now, sequence data takes a number of different forms. I don't have time to talk about that in great detail. In the old days, we just had single G reads, which is what I used to do, You a uh, very laborious process of sequencing a single gene, and then you get a single A, C, G, and T strand of however the band length it is. Um, we, those techniques were developed to produce finished, complete genomes. And of course, what we have now is we have a lot of next generation sequence data, and this is developing in all of the time, which tends to produce um, lots of short read data or different types of data, which can then uh, give you um, uh, uh, assemblies of information, which may be very close, but not quite whole genomes. But our platform's designed that we have something called a sequence bin, which means that each of these types of information can be accommodated. So for one um, bacterial specimen, we might only have a single gene, and this can be important because in a disease outbreak or epidemic, you epidemic, might you have might. lots of sequences. Lots of sequences. Um, um, it may be a complete whole genome, or it might be, as I say, these other short reads. So once we put this information in there, we can uh, uh, use the BigsDB platform to index the sequences, to link it with the provenance and phenotype data, and do what we call population annotation, identify all the genes, because we've got to identify for every all of the thousands and thousands of genomes we have now, we've got to identify all the genes and see what their variation is. And that gives you evolutionary analysis, importantly for this today's talk, AMR analysis, a typing, yeah, say linking to the type, and we also have exporting uh, available as well. And we've been developing this potent, uh, platform for a while, and I'm going to give you a bit of a, um, uh, hopefully as long as all goes well, a little bit of a demonstration of what we can do with those data at the moment, in a few moments. Right, so just to say, um, this is the, pipeline that we've mostly used there are other pipelines but it's pretty generic the good old days we still rely a lot on isolate growth although now there's increasing developments of what are called metagenomics where you get data from uh, from whole communities but i'm going to concentrate on isolates for today uh, so you get uh, you know a, a bacterial so, or clisum and sesamin you extract the dna you do some kind of sequencing there are many different platforms available this is quite an old slide with an old illumina but basically you may have heard of the nanopore for example, there's many, many techniques. Then you need to do something to assemble that into sequence it to make it those A, C's, G's and T's that the bioinformatics software can usually deal delve with. Um, then we put it into our database and then that gives us these plain language data afterwards. As I said, bioinformatics really is all about producing data that's useful to use. Um, so we're not, we're applying statistical genetics and analysis and statistics approaches um, rather than um, uh, rather than trying to develop them, although that's an important part. But generally, what you need is some sort of interface that will give the clinician, the public health official, or anybody uh, the um, the information they need. Um, so as I say, this is all integrated in our, um, our PubMLST database. And um, I'm just going to give you a little bit for the last bit of the talk. I'm going to give you a demonstration how that works. But uh, if that's OK, but if, um, uh, but before I go into that, are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions from what I've said so far? Uh, should I just oh, go on? Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy, or what do you think? Yeah, maybe yeah, if anyone has a question, we can kindly ask here as we progress. Um, if there's anything unclear, yeah, or so can... it's like yeah, it's like we don't have questions now. Uh, maybe we can uh -huh. progress. Yeah, we'll have a QA session a few minutes after the presentation. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. okay, thank so you. Let me just stop the presentation, right? So there we are, we've got that. Um, so now what I'm going to do is you can still see my screen, hopefully. Um, and I'm just going to show you. So this is now a live view of our, I'm being a bit brave. This is a live view of our database. Um, and you can probably see here that these databases are quite large. Um, we've got a million isolates in here now with uh, nearly a million genomes. Um, uh, we have a large number of organisms. If I just uh, uh, look at the, you can just see how many organisms there are. Um, there's about 160 different bacterials on the on this um, on the database that we have, um, uh, and uh, but I think I'll, I'll show you some data from the Niceria database. Um, so what you can see here is uh, 
on the front page to the Neisseria, and uh, the Neisseria database includes um, bacteria belonging to genus Neisseria. Now, there's two uh, important pathogens in that, the gonococcus, which is a major cause of uh, uh, um, STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections, big problem in many parts of Africa, um, and meningococcal disease caused by Neisseria meningitis. As I said earlier, very, very uh, closely related bacteria, but actually causing a very, very different diseases and have different, very, very different lifestyles. Um, so what you can see here is um, uh, 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 it shows the global distribution. As you can see, we do have quite a good distribution of um, uh, of strains from Africa, and we can go into the looking at the isolate collection. And you see, we get a dashboard here. Uh, showing all the different, uh, uh, and this is a customizable dashboard, so you can show it. So this shows you that most of the isolates we have in here are Neisseria meningitis, uh, some are Neisseria gonorrhea. These are the main causes of uh, disease. You can see when the samples were, uh, when when the data have been collected, and uh, you know this this is anybody can can submit their data to this database, um, um, and uh, you can see that we got the breakdown of the different types of. Uh, 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 in, in different types of information. Um, so for example, here, we can use this to explore the data and I'm just going to look at this. So if we want to look at, for example, um, what's going on in Africa um, and we want to look, say, for example, um, um, if we want to look at uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the country in Africa and maybe we want to look at um, the meningococcus capsule group and then um, what year it is, um, what year it was isolated. This gives you an opportunity of, of, of exploring some uh, some data. So here we are. This is our data explorer. We can see that we have um, 8,322 uh, records uh, from Africa. Um, we can see all the countries that we got information from, um, the most interestingly from Burkina Faso, but you can see many, many countries organized. I'm going to just have a little look here um, at Nigeria. And you can see with Nigeria, um, a lot of serogroup C strains. Now, this is interesting because historically, most ap epidemics in Africa were caused by serogroup A meningococcus, and we introduced a vaccine um, uh, in uh, 2010, um, um, which was originally in introduced in Burkina called uh, Menafribac, which has eliminated serogroup A epidemics in Africa. And uh, sure enough, if we look here, the serogroup A ones that we have in the database from um, and some, you know, there's quite a lot of them here. Uh, how many are there? The, 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 you can see that there's, uh, there's well, get those isolates there. Oh. Um, and uh, you can see you've got isolates from it. So let's just have a look. But we seem to have um, a whole load from uh, of Sierra Group C. And now that's interesting. These Sierra Group C um, isolates, as you can see, have all happened relatively recently. So it, it looks like there's something interesting going on there. By this drilling down, by looking, we, we can see that the, 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 there's some sort of, um, we, we're going through the database and we, we can structure this. So let's just see if we can um, find that. So what we can do is um, we can, um, uh, we can uh, sort of do a search here. And actually what we'll look to, it, we, we can, um, if we go onto the search field of-, of, of um, uh, Hello, Professor. Prof, yep. maybe, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, someone is asking maybe if possible they can expand a bit the presentation so that they can be able to see. Oh, can I not see the, uh, can you not see the screen? I think it is visible, but uh, I think it will be okay if you'll be able to expand. So that's on the full page now. Is that oh, okay? Can you... Okay, I think that's okay. We can go on. Can you see it? Yes, we can see. It's okay, Prof. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I know this but might be a problem. Some people might be looking on laptop, mightn't they? So okay. Saying, okay, so so what we were, so we're looking at those zero group C isolates. So we can do a quick search here. And as you can see, we got uh, um, we got one hundred and thirty eight uh, zero group C strains from Nigeria um, uh, over that period. So there's something interesting going on here and you can see there's lots of information. If we click on, um, uh, one of these isolate records, 
Uh, this tells us what the database has found in there. So it tells us uh, where this isolate was from. It tells you lots of information it's extracted from the genome. So just from those A's, C's and G's, it's extracted typing information. This is an invasive, so it's, a, it's come from a particular region. It has this capital data. This is where the basic data came from. This is the person who's put it in. And indeed, now we can see that uh, it's part of a publication that we can go to um, and we can look at all those isolates and this gives you information about the quality of the sequence bin so lots of interesting information um, and it shows us that uh, we've got very good data on this isolate so this is very good um, we can look down at, at the, the the records here and if we can look at um uh we can actually look at the town or city and we can see out of these isolates, we can see there's been a disease outbreak in a number of different places. So that's sort of very interesting. All of this we're getting now is uh, and this is actually from a real uh, uh, outbreak of disease. Um, and we can use this uh, nice little technique here called uh, grape tree, which was developed by some colleagues. Um, and what we can do there is we can say well, we want to look at these isolates. And what we want to do is we want to, um, we know that this is from, uh, we know it's from Africa, we know it's from, uh, um, we, we, because this is the search we did, we know they're from Africa, we know they're, we know they're from Nigeria. Um, it will be useful to have the region uh, or, or town or city, we'll have that. Um, the year we also need to know, and uh, we'll also be interested in the capsule group and uh, there's other things you can see down here, all sorts of interesting things you could choose, but I'm just going to choose here for the purposes of this representation, um, uh, the ST and clonal complex. And we can actually then do a very high resolution phylogenetic analysis using the core genome I mentioned earlier. And now what we have to do is uh, just wait and hopefully keep our fingers crossed that this happens quite quickly. I've got one that I did earlier, if this is a bit slow, but it's always a bit of a risk doing things um, uh, live in that they, don't, they, they may take a little bit of time to do, but it's sort of fun to show that these things can be done. All of this data, by the way, is open access. So any of you can do this analysis by just going onto the pubmlst.org website. This is all open access tools, all open access data. Any one of you can uh, can go and use this uh, if you wish to use. It's all open access. And um, so this is all of this is front end on basic bioinformatic tools uh, which have been developed. Um, so now, if I launch this program called Great Tree, this then is a high resolution representation of all those different isolates. So we know that these are all. Serial group C, we know they're all from Nigeria. We know they're all after the introduction of the serial group A vaccine in Nigeria. So this tells us something about what's going on. So let's see if we can find out anything about this, uh, um, about this epidemic. We'll just make this a dynamic tree, which rearranges it slightly. Uh, and then we can actually look at change the nodes. Because we pulled this other information over with us, we can, uh, for example, look at what clonal complex it is. And as you can see, it's all this particular clonal complex, which is very interesting. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we can we know it's all the same capsule group because they're all serial group C. We knew that. Um, uh, but what's quite interesting is to know the town or city. So this is interesting. You can see that this is found, the different types are found in lots of different parts of the city, lots of different cities. And we, we saw those regions earlier. Um, uh, but we can also uh, look at year. Now, this is sort of another interesting thing. And here we can change it. You notice it, the scale up here has been noted by the number of isolates per year, which is the number of cases that could be made. But actually, we can do something a little bit clever here. We can actually um, uh, we can actually order it by the year and we can change the color scheme um, to something called warm. So what this means is as it gets darker, the years get longer. So it's so the light years are early and the dark years are later. Now, what then becomes suddenly interesting, as you can see that, is that all of the earlier isolates are in colored in light colors. And although they are found throughout the time, um, you get these other variants emerging as you get later on. As you notice, as you go further out, you get um, 
uh, darker colors. So basically what's happening here is you're getting um, uh, a, a clone that's emerged, that has come in uh, to the population. It started causing disease. It spread to all these different regions and we've got some other variants uh, coming out. Now, this is important because uh, this is basically a, if essentially a vaccine escape move, mutant. And my colleague, Dominic Cagan, working with colleagues um, in, uh, um, uh, throughout the African continent, identified that this was a meningococcus that was originally probably not pathogenic. Um, and it acquired the group C capsule and some other pathogenicity item, um, uh, elements, which we can identify with genomic analyses. Um, uh, as a consequence, probably of the introduction of the serum group A vaccine. So one of the things we're doing now is putting in uh, the Serum Institute of Institute India with Mark LaForce is developing new vaccines which will combat five different serum groups of meningococcus. And I think I'm sort of out of time. So um, I hope that was uh, sort of a, a, a useful sort of illustration. But um, yeah, I'm happy now to take any uh, questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, that's a very wonderful presentation. I'm very, uh, I believe that uh, we have learned a lot because I think, yeah, um, even providing this very intriguing data of uh, using bioinformatics in infectious disease as well as, especially uh, maybe you could say, yeah, in AMR detection or characterization. It's very interesting. And I hope that, uh, uh, yeah, we have learned a lot in this. So taking uh, the first question that is from Ibrahima, is asking uh, Ibrahim, I think uh, your question is not uh, quite clear. When his country has no data available on the site, what to do? Maybe Ibrahim, if you can hear me, can Oh, yeah, no, I can hear that. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, um, so the, um, of course, we run a site um, which provides the infrastructure for doing this kind of analysis. Surveillance requires people to submit data. Um, and uh, and and that is really a, a, the big problem. So one of the issues is trying to make sure that people have the capacity and the willingness uh, to and the resources uh, to collect data and submit it. So yes, it, it is a big problem that uh, our data will never be complete. And uh, there's a lot of efforts to get genomic and other surveillance going, but um, in fact, that is a major problem. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Prof. Any other question? I don't know if someone else has a question. Feel free to unmute. Do we have another question? But I think, yeah, as we wait for uh, the rest of the question, maybe country, Prof, I just would like to, okay, maybe for someone else uh, to know also, as we characterize uh, microorganisms, like, for example, we need to determine uh, what actually has led to this, uh, maybe the change, the change of this particular pathogen. Uh, what actually do scientists focus on? Let's say, for example, we have this strain that is assistant to this particular uh, type of uh, antibiotics, but we have the other strain which is uh, uh, susceptible to uh, the same, same type of antibiotics. During characterization, what's actually the focus? What can tell us that, okay, this is has led to this uh, uh, difference in these strains of microorganisms. That is why we are seeing uh, this type of resistance. Over to you, Prof. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, um, so this, is, this comes down to the phenotype genotype uh, problem. So in other words, uh, antimicrobial resistance is a phenotype. It's a property, a biological property that an organism has and you can, uh, you can uh, uh, you can identify it now. Um, understanding what the genetic basis of that can be very easy, or it can be very difficult, and it, it varies a lot. So, for example, fluoroquinolones, um, uh, which attack gyra, um, the, which is one particular gene, there's a particular mutation that happens to make that those organisms resistant, and that's true for a number of other. Um, uh, that, that, and that's true for another number types of uh, um, antimicrobial resistance. Other, um, other antimicrobial resistance are due to uh, additional genes which either pump the antibiotic out or, or destroy the antibiotic or do some other function. So 
Uh, there are different genetic ways and bioinformatic ways of identifying those. Uh, one common, sometimes it can be done by standard biology, um, uh, particularly if you know what the target is. Uh, other times there are uh, approaches that are called, um, so, uh, we've done some of these, uh, what's called a genome-wide association study, where you take uh, populations of bacteria that uh, whole genome samples of bacteria that are resistant, for example, and not resistant, and you compare the two and you look for the genetic differences between them and try and identify uh, what they are. But yeah, that annotation and identification is an important process and it's often not very simple. Predicting antimicrobial resistance from just sequences can be fairly straightforward, just the possession the presence or absence of a gene or the presence or absence of mutation. But it can also be very difficult because sometimes antimicrobial resistance is due to something not obvious or not easy to measure, like, for example, changes in expression of a gene that helps them resist the antibiotic. So unfortunately, there's not one simple answer. There's lots of different antibiotics, lots of ways they become resistant, lots of ways. And, and, and so you have to, again, comes back to having the right tool to solve the right problem. Thank you so much, Prof. That's very useful. We have another question from Cosmos, and he's asking, since the genome are collected and sequenced, when there's a change in their response to antibiotics, how can the change be known in the bacteria for antibiotics produ production? Yeah. So I think, in other words, he's asking, how does this guide to uh, research and development of antibiotics? Well. So in the past, most, anti most antibiotics were um, have been developed uh, sort of um, just by a process of looking. Um, the vast majority of antibiotics uh, that have been used um, uh, therapeutically uh, were produced by other bacteria or other fun fungi, usually in the soil, as sort of uh, agents, uh, biological warfare agents against uh, bacteria. Um, penicillin, for example, is, 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 is the best example of that. So, um, so it, in the past, there's been a lot of searching, just looking for things. And we've sort of exhausted that approach um, because, of course, you've got to find an antimicrobial that, 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 that both works and that is not, um, not harmful to people. In, there are a number of designed antibiotics where people have understood the metabolism of the organism. And this is actually a field that's in its inst infancy, but this is where bioinformatics and AI are probably almost certainly has a, a, an option for them to meet. Now we have very large databases of bacteria. If we can character and their whole genomes, and we know, for example, all of the sequences of their ribosomes, which are important antimicrobial tar targets because they synthesize proteins and they're different from our ribosomes, then that gives us the prospect of using, perhaps uh, enhanced with AI, um, uh, designed approaches to actually uh, look at identify targets uh, and then making compounds that will attack, attack those targets. But, um, uh, but we're still, We've, we've done well against a few, and there's a few synthetic or semi-synthetic antibiotics, and we've, we've done a lot of modification of existing antibiotics, but, um, but really having a, a, a complete bottom-up design is, 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 a, is, is, is a process that lots of people are interested in, but has proved to be quite hard. And that's one reason why we don't have a lot of um, antibiotics. Well, we have a lot, but why we, have, we, we don't have lots of new ones coming on the stream. Okay, yeah, thank you, Prof. I think uh, that's quite uh, uh, understandable. And I think that also comes down to uh, structural based uh, uh, antibiotics research and design, because if we are able to determine the change in the phenotype of maybe, for example, the uh, drug receptor, I think that can also guide us in developing the antibiotic that is compatible to that particular uh, change in receptor. Yes, yeah. okay, yeah, sure. And that becomes a whole biology approach. Uh, yeah, you know, sure. bioinformatics takes a part of that, but it has structural biology and, and, and kinetics, and there's a whole, you know, the, it really requires a very, very deep knowledge of lots of different parts of biology to more put that together. But bioinformatics has a crucial part, part to play in it, in finding the, the variation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, now that I think, yeah, we can see uh, bioinformatics is really revolutionizing the uh, in infectious disease research, especially in... Um, what do you call it? Yeah, antimicrobial resistance. And now as compared to uh, microbial culturing or microbial cultivation in the wet lab, 
Arabic, which method could be convenient as compared to the other, or maybe cost in terms of cost effectiveness uh, and also convenience. Well, in terms of uh, of diagnostic type methods and so on, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. In terms of diagnostics. Yeah. So, so really, realistically, uh, there's a lot of talk about genomes and diagnosis, uh, and that's quite hard. The only, um, the only sort of, so you know, I was talking about a lot of these next generation sequencing platforms. Uh, they're very, very good, but they were designed to sequence. Um, they were designed to sequence sort of human genomes, which uh, have variation in a different kind of way. So we have to adapt the technologies to make them work for, 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 for bacteria. Um, the nanopore particularly uses a great, uh, uh, produces a great deal of data and the bioinformatics challenges in, of interpreting the data are quite hard, but possible. Um, in resource limited areas, which is sort of everywhere, actually, uh, that, that becomes a challenge. The, the technique of PCR, actually, which is single gene analysis, is um, some of you may have heard the gene expert, which has been used a lot for TB diagnosis. And that can be used for determining antimicrobial resistance as well. But those techniques are probably more useful in the field. The, the other techniques are, are more sort of expensive techniques, which are largely research bases. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Prof. I think that's very well understood. Yeah, sure. So we have another question from Eric. Uh, is it possible to apply stem cell approach in this bioinformatics process? Well, um, stem cells are something rather different. I mean, stem cells, of course, is 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 the ability to have eukaryotic cells that differentiate into. Um, uh, you know, to any kind of human cell. So that's not really uh, quite um, pertinent to our discussions today about antimicrobial resistance and bacteria. There are, there are no bacterial stem cells because all bacteria are essentially stem cells. So uh, uh, people can use bioinformatics to analyze, there's, and there's been some very, very good work done on cancers. Um, and again, that's highly dependent on bioinformatics and understanding how cancers develop and the mutations they get and how you can treat them with drugs. Um, so that, that that's that's sort of the most related area, I think. But stem cells are not really uh, uh, anything that would be that um, helpful in terms of antimicrobial or de developing new antimicrobials. Yeah, sure. OK, uh, thank you, Prof. I uh, don't think we have uh, any more question unless uh, if someone else has a question, you can kindly raise up your hand. But because of time, uh, just a few minutes, please. Okay. Yeah, we should be very quick on this. And uh, maybe we can take one last question from Cosmos again. He's asking, does the bacteria antigenic variations affect vaccine and antibiotics production? So, um, so antimicrobial resistance is usually separate from vaccine resistance, but unfortunately vaccine antigens are diverse and can vary and they are a big problem. We don't have really good vaccines against any significantly antimicrobially variant pathogen. So we, 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 we have sort of, generally you have to make cocktails, but it can be, yeah, an antigenic variation is a real problem if it occurs. Um, and it does challenge vaccines a lot. Um, it all depends on whether the, the pathogen has an effective way of, uh, of, of vaccine escape, and some do and some don't. So some vaccines are, are more challenged by antigenic variation than others. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, because of time, Prof, I don't know if you can allow me to take one final question, please. Of course, yes. Carry on. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so this is from uh, um, yeah, Irenia. She is asking, hello, Prof. Since humans will slightly respond to antimicrobials differently, I suppose antimicrobial resistance affecting humans are relative. So shouldn't personalized, should not personal medicine be a great deal to dealing with this issue? Um, well, with, with generally with antimicrobials, the more important thing is is the variation in the bacterium rather than the person. So 
by and large, personalised medicine doesn't have such a role in this. It's much more of a role, as I say, in things like cancer, where people can make personal drugs and so on. Um, uh, having better diagnostics so that you can be more specific with your treatment is another area. But yeah, generally what we're interested in here is the variation in the bacteria. Um, um, and the better targeted the antibiotics can be, the, the, the better. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Prof. I think, yeah, we have uh, another question here. Very interesting. I think uh, the topic is quite intriguing. And uh, uh, Abdullah is asking, do gender also count for antimicrobial when given? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that, so the, there's, the, 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 again, it, it's, it's mostly to do with the bacteria, but yes, different people can react differently to, 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 and can require different types of treatments. But yeah, but the, the most important thing in antimicrobial resistance and its effectiveness is, is, is to do with the bug. But of course, different people have different exposures to different bugs and you can have slightly different niches. So uh, the, the type of treatment regime can vary with age, Age and and yeah, so so that can be an important issue. Uh, by and large, it's less of an issue, as I said. With anti, with using antimicrobials, the, the main thing is the, the genetic properties of the bacterium. That's that that's you know other factors can be important, but it's it's the it's the genetics of the bacterium that's really the most important thing. Uh, fortunate, that's why they're so successful. Um, and of course, most antimicrobials are. Uh, that have been used uh, very successfully are quite broad spectrum so they take which is good and bad they they, they work against a wide variety of, of bacteria which is sort of good but that can lead uh, to resistance problems and it could also lead sometimes to treating people inappropriately you, you know you might you know you kill your own microbiota as well as the as well as the bacteria that causing disease so that's not always a good thing and that can vary microbiota can vary with gender of course as well so Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, someone else is asking. <laughs> yeah, how long do antibiotics last? Oh, ah, now. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm going to answer that in a number of ways uh, because that, 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 I, 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 because I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, so the usefulness of antibiotics is again very dependent on the individual bacterium so for example very early on in the treatment of um uh, of tb uh, because tb lives uh, if it, it, it invades it caught for, form it, it goes and lives in these granulomas drug treatment with tb can take a very long time now although tb doesn't it's a, one of the rare bacteria that doesn't exchange dna and it mutates relatively rarely because getting the dose of, of drugs to the bacteria in high enough rate is, 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 is quite challenging in the treatment regime. So, so even in the early days of treatment, uh, early on, antimicrobial was a resistance was a problem even within individual patients. So, for example, um, a number of the early people were only treated with one drug and they died. Um, because resistance arose during the treatment, because it's a long-term treatment. Um, that's why these multiple therapies were introduced for TB, and that sort of solved the problem. So, you know, the antibiotics there didn't last for very long um, uh, at all uh, before resistance arose. It's, it's risen straight away. The good news is because TB doesn't exchange DNA, it has to arise at new time in every case. So that's why many of you may know individuals who have TB and have a long course of multiple drugs, and that's essential. Um, other uh, other uh, antibiotics uh, variation can uh, other antibiotics of resistance can arrive, uh, you know, in the bacterium sooner or later. Um, even with the fluoroquinolones, which it was thought would be artificial vaccine, uh, artificial uh, um, uh, uh, antimicrobials, so they would last longer. Um, it's all really how long it lasts is a matter of how it's used and what the biology of the organism that uses it. But but. Um, um, now, if if the tech, if the question is how long do antimicrobials last in the environment, that again changes a little bit. But our environmental contamination with antibiotics can lead to resistance, so they can persist and cause problems as well. So I'm not quite sure which question it was, but hopefully that's both. But unfortunately, it's um, years, not and decades and years, not centuries that antimicrobials last. Although you can 
with good stewardship make them last longer? Hey, sure, Prof. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, very elaborative answer. And because of time, I have two questions more at the moment, but I can predict there are other questions coming because uh, the topic is becoming very interesting. So I'd just like to ask you, maybe if you have some time, we can handle those two first questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. So we have uh, one question. Yes, sir. Uh, let me read, uh, are there possible side effects of antibiotics? It is interesting that we have a quite a diverse uh, uh, a group of uh, audience here. So uh, yeah, 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 no. can no, you handle well, that question, Paul? So different antibiotics have different side effects. Most of the therapeutic antibiotics have limited side effects um, uh, uh, because that's why, the, you know, because there are lots of agents, there's lots of antimicrobial agents you can use, and the ones that come into therapeutic use have been chosen as the ones that have limited side effects. Now, they can be very different on different individuals, though. So some people, for example, might be allergic to particular types of antimicrobial Tetracyclines can be dangerous to certain peoples. It all depends on the dose. Therapeutically, it's normally the, the, the negative reactions are quite well known. But of course, the trouble is when you're treating very, very large numbers of people across the planet, you will occasionally have bad reactions. But most of most antimicrobials have quite well understood. And, and you know, if you look at you should get a data sheet within within a um, with any antimicrobial, and that should tell you what the common uh, the common side effects are. Well, there's two things. One is there's a side effect that sometimes they can they can have pharmacological effects with off target ones, and the other is actually treat as I say treating people with antimicrobials. That, you know that can check that can actually cause some problems by actually changing the <laughs> biota. Something, buddy. And did you say there was another one, Jimmy? Or uh, thank you, Prof. Yeah, I think yeah, I cannot address the other question. Yeah, I can't see the other question. So, okay. in case in case there will be other question, I'll keep you for Prof. Uh, because uh, we have a platform where we always communicate. Because actually, yeah, this is a team of champions, MR champions. Uh, so we have a platform that we discuss, we go on with our discussions. Uh, but yeah, I can see. I think yeah, the question is coming now from Jude. What are the effects of misuse of antibiotics? And I think yeah, the first question I I remember the question. Uh, it reads, uh, does overuse of antibiotics yeah. lead to antibiotic resistance? So we can handle those two questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're the same question basically. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Well, th there's two problems here uh, really. One is that um, if you use if you increase the con concentration of antibiotics around or you increase the number of views because most of these are natural products the resistance mechanisms have usually already exist this is true with the beta lactams for example which which uh, which which uh, which basically destroy penicillin uh, penicillin mold evolved uh, pe penicillin mold evolved penicillins in the soil in order to combat bacteria, then the bacteria evolved uh, beta lactamases that destroy penicillin. So they're already out there in the environment. So if you overuse them in the wrong circumstances, then using those mobilization mechanisms that I talked about, and the so 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 really we should use them sparingly, particularly what I call broad spectrum uh, antimicrobials. The other big problems, the other big misuse is a, a really classic thing is that people don't finish their antimicrobial course. So imagine the situation, this is very common. Somebody gets ill uh, and they go to a doctor um, uh, and they, and this actually TB is a good example of this. They go to the, the doctor and they get their tablets and they take the tablets and it makes them better. Now they're a bit better because they've sort of killed off most of the bacteria, but maybe not all of them. Now, particularly with some drugs, TB drugs are an example, but you, people might uh, forget to take them or they might find them unpleasant, so they don't take them. But that then means that the therapeutic course isn't completed. And that is exactly the situation where, um, uh, where you might get uh, the growth through of an antimicrobial resistant variant. And that is another example of misuse. So either using it um, uh, without knowing what the proper therapeutic dose is or knowing whether it's going to be effective or not using enough of it or not using it long enough can lead to perfect conditions. 
or the evolution of the of the of resistant bacteria because you're not killing off the whole population you just kill off part of it and then you then that gives you the opportunity to select the variant it is basically an evolutionary process antimicrobial agents are an evolutionary selective pressure if you put that evolutionary selective pressure onto the bug then they may well evolve to um uh, uh, to, to to avoid it and that's why we're it's sort of in the pickle we're in at the moment and fleming for example in his nobel lecture sort of predicted that this would happen you know all the years ago when he if you read fleming's nobel lecture he says you know people might if they don't use penicillin properly we will have lots of resistance and he was absolutely right Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Yeah, and I really hope that that answers the question very well. Okay, thank you so much. So I see no question. So I think we are going to terminate our Q &A session at this point. But in case we are going to receive any more question, I'll send to you, Prof. Uh, because yeah, uh, we may receive from uh, those people who are not in the session or who are in the session but would like to seek clarification on some aspects that we had just discussed. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Prof. So I oh. like to. Okay, Prof. You go on. You carry on. I was just going to say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I just like to say that. Uh, yeah. In in future, yeah, we might be interested in like welcoming you again in our future sessions uh, because we normally conduct these sessions uh, with a name to uh, actually promote. Uh, research among the students in terms of antibiotics or generally antimicrobial research and development and so on. So yeah, you might have another session coming next month or July, and we'll be happy to have you again, especially in this particular interesting topic of uh, bioinformatics on how we can also utilize uh, the advancements in technology in combating uh, these antimicrobial systems in such Thank you so much, Prof. And really just before I go, I've seen one more question. Why do antibiotics okay, not yeah, sure, prof. viruses? Yeah. Sure, prof. That is yeah. just because viruses are, are, and uh, have completely different metabolism to bacteria. So back to, antibiotics are generally, again, antimicrobials are basically targeting. You need an anti-flu drug, not an antibacterial drug. Anyway, that's it. So, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. That's a very critical question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, right. I really appreciate for uh, creating your time for us. And I thank no everyone for taking time to attend this session. And I believe that we have learned a lot. Thank you so much. And okay. bye. Thank bye, you all everyone. for your attention. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Prof. And bye bye.